working together to solve problems in agriculture with applied technology. Uh, diving a little bit into EduConnect, um, you might ask like why Grand Farm is doing this. Well, we want to connect the educators with the advanced technologies and the professionals representing different careers in ag, science, and technology. And this is not an objective that we just built overnight, but it came up after some research and hosting and, and attending a couple of listening sessions with the educators. And so some of the uh, pain points that did uh, pop up quite louder than others were lack of awareness and interest. Many students and parents and teachers are not aware of the opportunities that are available in ag tech, and hence they do not have a strong interest in the field. Limited exposure. Many students do not have access to hands-on experience in agriculture or ag tech, which limits their ability to learn about the field and develop important skills. Some of the other challenges were outdated curriculum, lack of resources, and limited diversity and inclusivity. Hence, Grand Farm came up with the objective to make teachers aware of Grand Farm as a resource that's available to them. And I talked about the, the ecosystem that we have. Uh, you, can, you can very well make use of our ecosystem. We do multiple projects and we will be having a dedicated facility in Castleton, North Dakota which will be available to the educators if you want to host any uh, events or if you want to attend any events, do any collaboration with Grand Farm, we'll be more than happy to work with you. And then the next objective is to bridge the gap between ag education and advanced technology. Having said that, um, I'd like to move forward uh, with due respect to the time. Uh, the sponsors, I would uh, really like to thank all of them, North Dakota Corn Council, Microsoft, North Dakota Farmers Bureau, Farm of Moorhead Economic Development, North Dakota Grown, Grain Growers Association, and Bite Speed. This workshop was not possible without them. As I mentioned, this is the first time we're hosting this, and we wanted some support to support our educators so that, that they can attend the Cultivate Conference and also earn the professional development credit. Uh, with that, I would now like to introduce my co-moderator for the day, Dr. Katherine Tyler, who also, uh, on three to call her just Katie. She is the uh, NDSU Extension Program Director and Extension Specialist. Uh, she leads the Rural Leadership North Dakota Program. She is an um, amazing woman. You must all connect with her. Um, Katie Tyler works with leaders to build the future of North Dakota in order to assist communities in intentionally building and transitioning leadership through time. She works to create connections, build relationships, and expand leadership potential throughout rural North Dakota. Katie earned her master's in educational leadership and PhD in education, health, and behavior studies from the University of North Dakota. Katie enjoys traveling and reading about the 1918 flu pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Katie Tyler. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here um, and to help um, moderate this panel of what looks to be like amazing um, professionals in the field. Um, I have a wide range of, of experience in education and I know how important it is to get those young people connected with the careers of tomorrow. So I'm excited that you're here and I'm excited to be here. A couple notes about today's session. This is going to be video recorded and so if you have questions about that or want a copy of it, talk to Rushi um, at the end and she can certainly get that for you. So a little bit about what we're gonna do today. Um, I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers individually. They're gonna come up and give a little bit of a presentation about what it is that they do and how they are. I forgot there was a slide. Thank you, Rushi. Um, this is <laughs> what we're full on reading. Yeah, that's what we're full on reading. Um, we're going to have all the speakers introduce and then we'll have some time for some questions and answers with the panel. Um, so certainly, um, if you have a burning question that you desperately need to get out, don't hesitate to ask it. But if you also just want to make a note of it, we'll have plenty of time at the end for that. And um, then, of course, we'll have some conclusions with announcements at the end. Um, so I'm excited to get started and to see um, what we're doing. And so our first speaker today is Dr. Zach, Zach Bateson, who is the research manager at the National Agricultural Genotyping Center, or the NAGC, a nonprofit diagnostic lab in Fargo, North Dakota. His research team develops tests to detect crop and pollinator pathogens in the environment. Zach works extensively with commodity groups, 
researchers, and growers to build surveillance programs that use NAGC's diagnostics. Zach also develops free classroom activities for teachers that include skills needed to develop diagnostic tests. Zach spends his free time getting lost in nature with his wife and two sons, taking care of their scaly pets and yanking weeds out of their pollinator garden. So please help me welcome Zach. I do have a teacher's voice, so I'll try not to yell at you. But, um, we do have a two free teacher, um, two day teacher workshop coming up next week. So if you're interested and want to hear more of my voice, um, please sign up for that. I'll have this information up at the end as well. Oh, I just killed my joke. All right. I have an addiction, that's why I'm here. It's an addiction for a molecule. It's not alcohol, okay? Caffeine is the second place um, possibility. No, it is this molecule right here. Deoxyribonucleic acid, or the DNA. I also thoroughly enjoy its close cousin, ribonucleic acid. Right? These two molecules are very important to the diagnostic lab that I work with, and they are very powerful for answering questions in agriculture that we couldn't do before the genomic era. Because one thing that we know is that DNA and RNA are found throughout the tree of life. My tree's not showing here. Um, but across the, the tree of life, um, there's DNA, RNA, and even thing microbes that are not technically living like viruses, they have genetic material that can uh, be useful for diagnostics. The problem is there's a lot of pests on this tree of life too. Right, so if we look across these different uh, kingdoms, uh, we're seeing all these different pathogens. What's also an issue is that these pest distributions are changing all the time. Right, because of global trade, it is so easy to bring pathogens that have potentially no uh, pathway here, here through sea trade, for example. Another problem is with climate change, we're seeing a lot of the southern pathogens and pests starting to go north. And that's a huge problem because a lot of the agriculture that we have isn't um, available, the technology isn't available yet to deal with these organisms. And so we have to think about all this pest distribution and how it's changing um, rapidly through time. And so one way we do that is with molecular diagnostics. And so we're not necessarily uh, detecting the pathogen itself, but the genetic material that these pathogens contain. So the RNA of viruses, for example, and the DNA and all these other pathogens. And so this is biotechnology, that's the core um, science that we use at the company I work for. So just because there's teachers here, a little bit of background of how we do this diagnostic testing is we really focus on these regions of the genome called uh, barcode regions. And so you can think of these regions just like the barcodes that we have at the grocery store, right? These barcodes allow us to distinguish different food products from one another using a scanner. That's exactly what we do with milk diagnostics. We hone in on these barcode regions where if you look at a series of pests, one, two, and three here, and we align their, their genome at a certain site, we can see where these differences lie. And that's what we hone in on to develop these tests. And so these tests are important because they help distinguish pests from one another because there's a different management that you use for all these different pests. And so that's kind of where my company comes into play. So we're the National Agricultural Genome Tanning Center. And so we work with both academics, allowing them to use our testing services to generate data from pathogens and pests in their uh, research programs, but then we're also working with farmers, agronomists, even beekeepers um, to help them use our services in healthy pest management. Because what we know is that an effective management begins with proper diagnosis. For example, on the field, if a farmer thinks it's a bacterial pathogen cause, or a fungal pathogen, excuse me, causing an issue, and they spray it with fungicide, but it's actually a bacterial pathogen, it's going to be ineffective and that the grower just lost the money in the spring or something that's not going on. So I want to briefly touch on a couple of our projects that we work 
we're working on currently. The uh, first one is molecular diagnostics and bee tests. So uh, beekeeping is a huge business in North Dakota. So we've been the number one honey producing state for many years. And so every year, about half a million colonies of bees come to our state to produce honey. The thing is, is that they're not only important for honey, but they're also important, important for pollinating a lot of our food crops too. So for example, almonds in the central part of California, two million honeybee colonies go to California to pollinate 80% of the world's almonds. So these bees are very important not only for honey, but for plant pollination as well. Here's the problem. Beekeepers are struggling to maintain colonies. Colonies, the queen itself should live five years at the most, but they're having to replace so many colonies each year. 20% they say they can handle, 40% really disrupts uh, the business. Some have gone out of the business when you have levels that high for so many years. And so the question is, what's causing this? Well, like anything in biology, it's complicated. There's multiple factors that contribute to colony deaths. We, as a diagnostic lab, we focus on the pathogens. And so there will be a pop quiz at the end. You have to list all of these by number. <laughs> Um, what I just wanted to point out though is that we test a lot of viruses that are transmitted by this mite called the Varroa disruptor mite. It's a very good name for that uh, pest. But that tick essentially is transmitting a lot of these viruses, but there's bacterial pathogens, fungal pathogens, uh, protists, single cell organisms that cause disease. And then this new mite, Triple A Labs, it's not here in the States yet but it's going to be a considerable problem if it does show up. So part of our job as a diagnostic lab is we're starting a nationwide survey to try to detect that light in these colonies uh, in the US. So as I kind of mentioned, DNA is everywhere across the tree of life. Well, we can use the same technology we use in bees for pathogens to use for plant pathogens. And so we are a part of a project that is looking at how we can detect the pathogen before it becomes a disease or an issue in the field of probes. So can we detect the pathogen before it becomes a problem? And here's the problem. Globally, 17 to 30% of yield loss is caused by pests. Most of those are insects. Others are going to be you know, bacterial or fungal pathogens as well. And so if you look across the major food crops of the world, this is a considerable problem. And so we are part of this National Predictive Modeling Tool Initiative. So this is appropriational funds. And so there's 27 different universities and research institutions a part of this project. Our part as a diagnostic lab is to be the hub that all these universities are sending us samples. What they're doing is they're sampling the air uh, near the fields with these very extensive spore suckers, but also homemade uh, spore traps. And so they send us these uh, small tubes from the air collected from the field, and we're trying to detect that pathogen before they see it in the field. And the whole point of that is to see if we can use molecular diagnostics to improve risk models. Because right now, a lot of growers, what they're using are these risk models based off of the data. Don't get me wrong, that's good. That's great that you're using it. They, they're very useful, but that's only one side of the disease triangle. You also need to have the pathogen present for the disease to occur. And so that's where an agency comes in, is that we're providing those pathogen data for these researchers to make their models more accurate. So to kind of summarize, uh, one of your diagnostics is critical for pest ID and environment. So we're able to test soil, we're able to test the air for these pathogens before they become a problem using one of your diagnostics. For any biology teachers out there that teach medical science, molecular diagnostics is important to agriculture too. So there's a lot of different success stories and research that use the molecular diagnostics in the agricultural sector, just like in medical sciences. So there's these strong connections between medical and agricultural science. And there's pretty good job security too. We're always going to have pests. They're always going to be a problem. And so they need to find ways to detect them quicker in the field. And so there's a, a strong career for this as well. And most of 
uh, the scales are based on the global laboratory and the computational skills that goes along. And so I sit down for a lot of my job. And so what I do is I develop these lessons, like this one here, and I travel around to national teacher conferences, trying to convince teachers that bioinformatics or DNA analysis on the computer is a very critical skill um, going into a university. So I provide these, these free lessons with uh, our partners, education projects. So with that, um, we do have that two, uh, free two-day teacher workshop uh, next week. So if you're interested, come, come see me, contact me about it, and we'll get you signed up. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Ed. I already have so many questions. <laughs> Just so you know. Don't you worry, though. I'm going to wait. I was a biology undergrad. I have a BS in biology. And if I was going to, st if I would have gotten a, a PhD in biology, which I clearly didn't, I wanted to study bees. So like I was, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ace your test. Don't you worry. Um, okay, let's see here. Oh, there's another um, comment about this, this um, oh, workshop. Yes. Okay, well, we'll put it back up when you guys have questions. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Paulo Flores, who is an assistant professor at the Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering Department at NBSU. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Agronomy at the Federal University of Santa Maria and his Master's and Doctorate degrees in Soil Sciences at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. At NBSU, Professor Flores developed three new courses in precision, precision agriculture and co-developed another course on the use of drones for precision egg. He researches the use of drones and sensors for site-specific weed control, and he also investigates implementing high thoroughbred phenotyping approaches in several NDSU plant breeding programs. Professor Flores has authored and co-authored several research papers on the use of drones, sensors, and imagery analysis for agricultural purposes. Please help me welcome Dr. Flores. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, what I'm you asking me to do today is to do a brief uh, introduction to precision agriculture. So, that's what I'm going to try to do here with you guys today. So, um, you can ask this question to 10 people, and all 10 people will come up with a, a different answer. What is, how you define precision agriculture? What is precision agriculture? So just make sure that we all are talking the same thing. When we're talking precision agriculture, I always like to use the definition from um, the International Society for Precision Agriculture. And you can see we have a long definition um, and a succinct version. And I, I much rather to use this version where precision agriculture is a management strategy that takes account of temporal and spatial viability to improve sustainability on agricultural production. So, two key words here, temporal and spatial viability. Um, one thing I think most people are aware of is precision agriculture relies a lot in a GPS unit. So, so how we take into account of that is spatial viability. If we don't know, we are at all the time. So, if you look a little bit about GPS history, so in 1983, the GPS was made available for public use for the first time. We were looking at accuracies like 100 meters or so, 300 feet or so. Um, um, in 2000, what happens? The government uh, turned off what they call selective like availability, which kind of degraded. Uh, Something that used, they used to degrade the signal, so the accuracy improved to two to three meters. Um, and currently, we have RTK um, solutions that uh, are sub sub centimeter, sub inch um, accuracy. <coughs> so, Katie, could you help me here, please? So, so if you take Look at this string here. Uh, this is around eight feet long. 
Okay, and that's around two kilometers long. And this would be the accuracy of your GPS. So, for example, if you want to display your fertilizer on this table here, okay, this is your point. But you don't know for certain where this table is in space because it could be anywhere inside of the circle. Okay? So what the RPK technology did, now the accuracy or inaccuracy or uncertainty that you have regarding the position of this table is this big. Right? This is a one uh, two inch uh, piece of metal. And now is the difference of uh, this table being here or here instead of the side of the desert. And this has huge applications for uh, agriculture. For example, if you look, um, can you play this video for me, please? Can I play from here? No. Oh, it's just image? Yeah. Oh, so that's too bad. <laughs> so, but the, the point for the RTK, if it, you look at this tractor, it has uh, double wheels, okay? And between the wheels of this tractor here, there is a row of soils. And the guy that's driving the tractor, he does not touch the, the steering wheel and that tractor never runs over a side in the road, okay? And this piece of equipment that he's running here is running one inch or so away from the side in the road. The knives that are cutting the weeds that you see between the road never cuts one way because of that accuracy, okay? So, uh, this, so that's a little bit about the spatial side of things. Now, another thing that we have to understand when we talk about precision agriculture is variability across. There are no two fields that are the same. And there are, um, if you really like soil classes, you can go and understand how uh, many of the factors affect uh, different attributes in soils. Uh, but we have basically natural cause, and then we have uh, anthropological cause that basically mainly man main, main cause. Like for example, when you are applying manure or fertilizer across a field, and you get some sort of application like this, you can clearly see that you know, spaces like this are gonna have the less nutrients, cause more variability uh, than others. So, um, and one way that we um, can measure the variability to be able to act upon using precision technology uh, tools, probably the most, two of the ways, best ways used, first one is uh, when you harvesting uh, your field, we have a, what we call a payload monitor system that we are able to map um, what your field is outputting every second, basically. Okay, and that's what you see in this field here. This is like 100 something, 160 acres or so. And you can see that each point there is a, a measurement in field. Uh, and I think this is um, corn, a corn field in 28. So, another way that we, we can measure variability in the field and it kind of accounts for the more of the temporal variability is to satellite imagery. Okay? And the technology of satellite imagery today uh, is so advanced that you can almost get imagery every day. So some companies are offering um, like every day, every single day you get satellite imagery. Of course, I can't think there's some days that are cold conditions and you're not gonna get it. But three to seven days is very common. So if you look 
for the growing season, you're going to have the many, many images of your field. Uh, so you can see how does your crop change uh, throughout the time and look at the temporal viability. Uh, <clears throat> and what, why we're measuring all of this spatial and temporal viability? And let me just talk a, a, about a few of them. But um, farmers or companies, they can measure so many other um, characteristics that can be used to characterize variability in the field. And the whole point is to kind of put this somehow together, throw it to a software program that will output something like this, what we call uh, a prescription map or a narthax map. And just like the doctor prescribed you, prescribed you a medicine when you're sick, we're just basically prescribing different rates of whatever fertilizer or uh, chemical application that you're doing for different parts of the field because the viability of the field. Now, so the whole point here is that this technology allows us to treat different parts of the field in different ways because we're able to measure that viability. And here is where, again, that GPS uh, <clears throat> makes everything possible. So if you imagine um, going here, you're driving your tractor down here, and GPS is keeping track of the position of your tractor. So you go green, 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 yellow, green, 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 red. So it changes based on the position where the equipment is, um, independent equipment that you're using, you will change the amount of the product that you are applying. Okay? And <clears throat> this is supposed to be another video, but it's not gonna play. So it basically displaying what you, I was kind of referring to on that screen, where you have a prescription app, and the sprayer is going in the field, and when it hits this kind of greenish cells here, Instead of applying the same rate that I was applying the whole field, it changed the rate. On this case, it's just shutting the nozzle off. It's not applying anything. So, um, it's... Well, I was supposed to have two other slides here, but they're not here. So, you might be asking yourself, why, <coughs> uh, why are you doing this? Basically, you know, farmers are in the business of making money as well. And if you're treating your field as they were equal and there is no viability, there are times that you might make money, but there are times that you might be losing money. And there are parts of the field that you might always be losing money because you don't know how much, what is the potential of those days uh, for this. Uh, or in science or whatever So um, having some of this technology allows us to better manage variability across fields and increase the likelihood to have some problems and increase sustainability uh, from those fields as well. So thank you, appreciate your time. We'll maybe be able to send out some of the slides for yeah. everyone so you guys can watch the videos because I'm sure they're really oh, interesting. Yeah, for sure. yeah. awesome. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Flores. That was super interesting. I, I also have my list of questions ready for you. So if the rest of you don't have questions, don't worry. Um, all right, our next speaker is um, Darla Lewandowski. Um, in her current role with Eden Grow Systems, she does a little bit of everything from business development to growing operations and customer support. Prior to her current position, she spent three years as an intern in Clay County Solid Waste, where she worked as a project manager. During this time, she led the Fargo-Moorhead Plastic Bank Task Force and facilitated local recycling and composting projects. 
She's a graduate of Minnesota State University Moorhead, where she earned a Bachelor's of Science in Project Management and completed three minors in operation man Operations Management, Lean Quality Management, and CRM. Please help me welcome Darla. This grow tower here is a prime example of that. So a lot of greenhouses, people use um, different types of systems to be able to grow. They're all a hydroponic systems. So you've seen these freight farms with plenty. They've gained some pretty big traction over the recent months and the last few years, especially as things have changed within our region and across the world with climate instability. Um, one of the big things that we focus on in Eden is using innovation and technology to help feed the future. So we try to create the optimal growing conditions with our automated grow towers. Our grow towers. Ooh, Sorry, these are our grow towers. We have several different iterations of them, and you can grow several different types of plants in them. So, hydroponics is an umbrella term. Basically, what hydroponics is is a way to grow plants in water, and what our system uses is aeroponics. So, it's a combination of air and water. So, at the Eden. Um, so this is our grow tower. We've got some plenty of plants growing in there. You can see over here we also have some tomatoes and green beans. We've got some flowers over here as well. We're hopefully going to get some tomatoes soon. Some of the green beans are ready to pick. Um, so what we do here, um, the automated system basically sprays the roots of the crops about every 30 minutes or so for about two to three minutes and it supplies them with all the nutrients they need to grow without soil. Um, the droplet size that we have used for the aeroponic system was created by NASA. They did a bunch of science and studies, so we became a NASA spin-off company to utilize their technology. We recognized, we were actually recognized in their, um, their article in the NASA spin-off magazine, so that was pretty cool. Um, right. So these are some of the crops that we can grow in our systems because of the way that our system is designed. We have peppers potatoes, carrots, we grow strawberries. We actually have a project out in White Salmon right now where we are growing raspberries. I've heard they're delicious, but I have not had the opportunity of trying them myself. Um, we grow leafy greens, of course, that is a typical crop for most indoor agricultural systems. Right. So I'll just walk you guys through a little bit of how this system works for those of you who might not be able to see the grow tower over here to my right. What we have is the bottom is our reservoir. That is where the nutrient solution is, and that is what the plants need to grow. It also has the capability for aquaponics as well, so you can raise fish, prawns, different smaller um, organisms. Those create a bunch of waste, and that waste is used to feed the plants. So you can either do nutrient solution or um, the fish cultivation. So what happens is the water is pumped up through these small emitters, and then the roots are misted. Once they're misted, the plants get everything that they need to grow. They are using a LED full light full spectrum light that allows the plants to grow to artificially simulate sunlight um, instead of like a greenhouse where they actually allow the sunlight to come in. These are designed to go in areas that are hard to cultivate, so basements, your garage, places that really wouldn't think plants would want to grow. This is optimal for them to grow in those conditions. So as you can see here, the root systems are very bright white. So one of the things that aeroponics does is it incorporates air into the system and into the roots. And this allows for the system, or the plants rather, to not get root rot. And that gives us the ability to grow root crops such as potatoes, carrots, and beets. We are one of the only systems on the market right now that can do that and have the capability to grow those successfully. So what is it that we're eating in our food and why does it matter? This is the right slide, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so one of the issues that we're facing right now is the arable land is decreasing that we can put crops into. Um, we're facing climate instability, uh, weather and weather instability as well, droughts, too much rain, too little rain. Um, but we had winter last about nine months this year and barely even had a spring. <laughs> So we have a very short growing season. Um, we, with these indoor systems, we can go 365 days a year. Just this last um, spring, rather, we harvested some San Marzan tomatoes, and I believe it was like 20 degrees outside, and they were fresh and ripe and ready to harvest. So how many of you guys buy fresh produce? Show of hands. I think most of us do. How many of you end up throwing it away because you don't get a chance to use it, or it goes bad in the refrigerator? 90% of us, I would say. 
So the reason why that happens is because we're so far from the supply chain. When we harvest produce, it takes anywhere from two to three weeks to get to us and get into our fridge, and then sometimes it's even longer. One key thing to note about that is that produce, once it's harvested, starts to lose its nutritional value. So spinach, for instance, loses up to 90% of its nutritional value within 24 hours of being harvested. So a lot of the things that we're missing in our daily diets is caused by our supply chain being so distant. So one of our missions at Eden is to shorten that supply chain, provide urban jobs, reduce waste, and use unwanted space and increase food nutrition. So on their systems, we can place them in any optimal or any non-optimal condition. So areas where food deserts happen, where there's food insecurity, one in every 10 Americans does not have access to fresh food. And that's a sad fact. So our goal is to try to increase that. We can place these towers in areas where food doesn't grow. North Dakota is one of them. Places in Africa, rural deserts, um, islands out in the Pacific where local Marines and um, military special forces are located where they don't have access to that fresh food as well. So, why does this matter? So what we're trying to do is increase the amount of people that are involved in indoor agriculture. Educators play a key pivotal role in shaping the minds of the future. Together we can equip them with the tools and knowledge to tackle the changing world. So urbanization is something that we face um, in this modern world. A lot of kids are not staying on the family farm, they're moving into the city, they're getting jobs, going to college, they're not really moving back out there. The average farmer today is about 40 to 50 years old, so we're not really attracting those young minds. So what we'd like to do is um, create more of a workforce of kids that are willing and wanting to get involved with this industry. The US Labor uh, Statistics, Bureau of Labor Statistics, sorry, is predicting a 6% increase by the year 2030 in indoor agriculture. The demand for local food is on the rise. People are curious and want to know where their food is coming from and that it's healthy and safe to eat. That there's no herbicides or pesticides, which is something that indoor agriculture allows you to do. We don't have to do all the spraying for pests and things like that. Of course, there are a few that um, make their way indoors. That's always an issue there. All right, so teaching young minds that we can grow our own food and provide food for the future. A lot of these kids have a disconnection with where their food actually comes from. You ask a kid where a chicken nugget from, comes from, and they're gonna tell you, well, the grocery store or the freezer. And we all know that's not the case. It comes from the farm, from a chicken, and that whole process. Um, so what we want to do is we want to teach these kids how to grow and give them access to fresh food for their school projects. So culinary arts programs, if your kid has home ec, I think they might have done away with that already, but they're cooking these fresh things in school in this kid's cafeteria. They're harvesting fresh produce that they can use. Um, they've been able to grow these plants and sell them to the local community to raise funds for the school as well. We did garden plants this year. We sold those to the public and raised some money for our own business. Um, and extra plants and things that we're not eating that isn't going to go into the kids' school lunches or their snack can be donated or given back to the kids to bring home to their families. Um, I was talking to a teacher the other day and she said over half of her students had never experienced having a fresh salad before or even eaten lettuce. So that's something that we really need to increase the amount of vegetables and produce that our young generation is consuming. Alrighty, so... What our STEM education provides is a rich educational platform with a hands-on approach. Um, we lean into learning about how the plants grow, why they grow, the biology, seed, genetics, chemistry, bioengineering, and business applications. Not quite there yet, hang on. <laughs> so one of the big things that we are involved in is ag tech. That's why we're here at Cultivate today. So we work with innovative technology to create this system. It is all automated. Everything that it does is done by a computer. You can tell it to do stuff on your own. It has Bluetooth capabilities to work over your Wi-Fi network. You can be all the way down in the Twin Cities and tell your girl tower what to do. It'll alert you and let you know what you're doing in that time. Uh, but we need to innovate new ways to make this more cost effective. So we need young minds working on ways to create effective, um, cost effective sensors, monitoring equipment, and microcontrollers. We also have software developers and engineering that we need to be able to create this software and develop the platform. Automation and data analytics. We want to gather as much information as we can about these crops so that we can learn how to cultivate them in the best way possible. Having those young minds to be able to create these innovative new ideas is key to the future of this industry. So science biology, of course we all know plants are all about biology and science, but photosynthesis, learning about how and why these plants grow, what stressors and external stimuli happen in the outdoor typical traditional agricultural world and how that affects them. We can simulate some of that in the grow tower so that these kids can learn what a drought's gonna look like and how it affects the plant's growth. 
We also want these kids to have a sustainability uh, mindset and have environmental stewardship. So it teaches the impact of conventional farming, how it uses the land and water use, runoff and chemical use. Indoor farming uses 90 to 98% less water than traditional agriculture, and that's the statistics vary depending on where you're at due to evaporation and different climate events. Um, but we want to be able to discuss uh, restoring conservation of natural resources, waste reduction, and the carbon footprint and carbon reduction. So overall, the system that we have put in place here is a cross-circular integration. Indoor ag comes with multiple subjects that are holistic and well-rounded. We want to also collaborate within the community and we offer those with the university partnerships, commitments to local businesses, ag tech industries, technical businesses, and just local businesses in general. And then these are the partnerships with the universities that we have right now. We're working on developing quite a few more. Uh, Texas A&M has been very instrumental. This grow tower will actually be going over to Dr. Shetty over at NBSU here after this conference. We left it here just for you guys. Um, but yeah, you have any questions? Can we play this video or not? I didn't know, we're having issues, so. Okay, um, anyway, just a video of my founder letting you know why we're cool and all the fun stuff. <laughs> why food security is important. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions or want to help get these into your school, teach your kids about food security, and want to increase food nutrition and security and safety, let me know. My information is on the next slide. And also there is a brochure for you guys to take a look at with our information as well, the seats next to you. So many amazing things. That's awesome. Um, I would have loved a tomato, you know, when it was 20 below outside. <laughs> a nice, fresh tomato. Um, all right. Our next speaker is Garrett Maurer, who is the Director of Global Digital Project Man Product Management at Doosan Bobcat. He has a wide range of experience, including hydraulics engineering, systems, business management, and production. Garrett finds purpose with three professional objectives, to create amazing products and solutions for people, to develop environments where professionals can find fulfillment and embrace culture that empowers them to be successful, and to continually develop himself into a better person and leader than he was yesterday. Outside his career, Garrett is a husband and father of three wonderful children. He enjoys functional fitness and believes in the power of a healthy body and mind connection. He also loves reading, writing, and playing tabletop games. Please help me welcome Garrett. Hi, everyone. Um, where I want to start is with the recognition of even what we're trying to do today. And it, it reflects on, as I was thinking about what did I want to talk and try to share today, and everyone that's been up here, Ruchi, Paul, Katie, all, all the speakers, Darla, everyone's trying to tell a story, right? And how can I, as a professional, through my career, try to share something, share some insight with this group that may have an impact on how you teach, on your students, on how to prepare the next generation for the professional world? And what impacts and what has a lot of impact on me is the art of storytelling and how important it is in our professional careers, whether we are an engineer, whether we're a marketer, whether we're a teacher, whether we're whomever. Storytelling is about communication. And so as we go through and talk, I want to try to share a story with you. I want to describe who I am, why it matters, maybe build a little bit of credibility. Who is this character that stands in front of you? Talk about what I do a little bit, and then get into some lessons I've learned and share my experience in life with how storytelling has impacted my professional career and how I would advocate and encourage all of us to teach the next generation about the importance of it. So we've, we've done some introductions. Um, I, I was born an engineer. Uh, my parents would look at me and, and they would see if people that interact with me with the, the, the detailed methodology and things like that. That's, that's who I've always been. My background, I'm with NBSU, mechanical engineering. Uh, I started my career in hydraulics. And through a number of experiences, I learned how important it was to be able to tell a narrative and tell a narrative that mattered, that had value. And I actually worked on projects, products, ideas that were immense failures. And it's because we didn't understand the story we were trying to tell. We couldn't convince someone 
of the value of the story we were trying to tell. And that became important. That became a pivotal moment in my life and my professional career where I said, I want to do that. I want to help do that. And so I moved into business development. I left what's called solutions engineering for a company. We went out and tried to convince other large entities, com companies, businesses to invest money with us to build their products and go through that whole process. And then eventually I found myself in what I hadn't known of, but product with a capital P. And something that is just starting to gain traction in education is the idea of product and the idea of product management, right? And that is identifying problems and the value associated with those problems. That is essentially what I do today as Director of Product Management within New Sun Bobcat, is I am looking at what are the problems we want to solve, how do we prioritize those problems, and ultimately how do we bring them to market so that people can realize value from them. As it was mentioned, I, I love my family. Uh, I've got three kids, one on the way, um, and beyond between functional fitness and some reading and writing, and then my family and career, that basically sums up my life. So, give a little background there. Yeah, Oh, wow. Um, so, what is, what is product management? What do I do today? It's, it's the crossroad of uh, business, customer, and development. Right, and it's this blending of understanding not only what does the business need to succeed, what do our customers need? Customers come first. It's so important. And then how do we technically get there? You can't. You, you need to develop a solution ultimately to serve that. And what I focus on, you can't see the graph here, but there's really five aspects to creating value, right? And I would emphasize this as talking with students, even in, in a personal life, your own personal life, or your career, or how you want to advance. There's really five key parts to it. Number one is, is any kind of measurable return, right? And that's, that's things like making money or shortening the time it takes to do something or helping someone out. There's removing friction, which is simplifying things, improving efficiencies, the efficacy of teams or how you move through an activity. There is calling people to action. Can you get people to do something different because of what you've told them? That's value to people. If you're not asking somebody to do something different or showing them the way, right? Maybe it's hydroponics, right? We're showing a call to action because of different climate needs and other restraints in the world. That's an opportunity, whether it's precision agriculture. A lot of my background is precision agriculture prior to being a Bobcat. There's so many different aspects of calling to action. There's behavior and then ultimately there's education, right? Telling people and teaching people something they don't already know. That's why we're here. Right, to do that. That's part of the story, that's part of the narrative that this group is trying to tell. How do we educate people more on what they don't already know? And as a product manager, that's my job. I get to be the team that does that professionally. We go out and identify the problems and help educate people on what they need to do, and we make the decisions and help drive the priority on what problems are we going to solve first to help our customers, to help our company, to help people. One of the products I work on is called Bobcat Machine IQ. I just want to touch on it briefly as a little bit of more, a little bit of context. This is a connected fleet worldwide where we are taking our machines and we're providing insight into how those machines operate to tell the story to the owner, the operator, the dealership, whomever, about the importance of what, what are their machines doing? How are they operating? Are they operating well? And ultimately, going back to those five, those five slices, those five pillars, can we educate them on something they didn't already know? Can we get them to can we get them to change their behavior, et cetera? Can we drive some kind of measurable return that drives the top line and the bottom line of the company? And another snapshot of that is we are in, in near real time collecting the information and presenting it to meaningful ways back to the dealer or the customer or whomever the user is. Now I want to move on to storytelling in the professional world. A couple of, uh, a quote that I found, one of my favorite authors, you know, storytelling is not to tell you how to think, but it's to get you to ask questions, right? And I can't tell you from my own professional experience, if there is something that has helped propel me, it's a curiosity to ask questions, to be, to find no shame in asking questions, whether you know something or not, or you want to know more. The excitement over asking about ease, right? 
how, how can we impact people? I wish, as a, as a child, that I would have been comfortable with that level of enthusiasm about leads. Because that would have helped propel me forward. And trying to encourage people to do that and share that story is critical. And then for me, I go with this, and nothing differentiates a professional like the ability to tell a narrative, right? To get an audience excited about a narrative, whether that be a group of people here, whether that be colleagues, whether that be other professors, whether that be students. And nothing differentiates a leader like getting that audience to write the narrative with them. And I think that is for me and what I take from my own career and how I've been able to progress is an ability to try to not only show a story or tell a story, but get others to write the story with me. Whether it be machine IQ, whether it be learning opportunities, whether it be how to develop, whether it be how to work with students, to try to get people excited. If there's something I hope that any of you can take away from this is that power and that excitement of telling that story and getting students to tell that story. So what is storytelling? It's narration. It's the ability to communicate. It's one aspect of storytelling are books. I read books to my children every day, right? Those are beautiful stories. In the professional world, it's about how do you communicate orally, the oration portion of it, and how do you compose, composition, how do you write? I can't tell you how impactful it is to be able to do those things well. And it doesn't matter if you're an artist, or if you're an engineer, or if you're a salesperson, or if you're an operations specialist, whatever it may be, the ability to communicate is what storytelling is about. And in a professional world, that comes down to oration, that comes down to composition. And bringing that and showing that to anyone, especially students, that power, the only way to get an idea accepted is to convince others that it's worth accepting. And you're going to tell a story whether you, whether you want to or not. And if you think in your own career, or people that have had impact on you, even in, even in you know the, the stereotypical software developer who maybe isn't the most vocal, when you can get them and people open up about what they, they want, what they're looking at, and they can tell you that story, that has an impact. And for students entering the world, and how so much of the narrative today is how people want to have an impact, the importance of storytelling becomes more and more paramount. So a few, as, as we wrap this up in the importance of storytelling, a few lessons I want to share of my own experiences. You know, number one, when you're storytelling, know your objective. When I sat down and thought through what I wanted to share here, the first thing I said is, what do I want the group to take away? I'm a professional in, the, in, in my career. I'm speaking in front of a number of educators who want to help connect the professional world to students, right? And to help the professionals of tomorrow. How can we do that? And I wanted to share something that perhaps provided some insight that you wouldn't have gotten. How do you know what your objective is. How do you know what is it that you want to communicate? And that's a key aspect of storytelling. Speaking to the audience. If there's an aspect of my career that I think, and a skill that I've worked on, it's being able to speak to different audiences. Whether it be a general assembly, like we have in front of us, of educators and other professionals, whether it be students, whether it be a team of, of marketing professionals, whether it be a, a group of sales professionals, engineers, etc. Know your audience. And if there's something that I could encourage us to teach the students and the professionals of tomorrow, is to think about who you're talking to and learn how to craft a narrative that speaks to them. That's the impact. I can't walk away from this conversation today and say, I did a good job. I hope so. I hope that this conversation has impacted the story I'm trying to tell has impacted. Ultimately, you're receiving the story. You have to decide. Me saying it was a good story isn't enough. It's gotta be about you, that's the point. Being a teacher and a student, we've been, I've spent a lot of time in the last few weeks working on the strategy, and I could come up here and tell you how to write a good story. That's my frame, right? I could be the teacher. Perhaps on some aspects, there's a, there's a, a, a modicum of that in what I'm sharing now. 
it's important the act of storytelling, being truly good at it, you've got to write narratives together. You've got to be both the teacher and the student when you're working through it, and you've got to learn how to bring that story out, because I promise you, for your students and for anyone that's interested, being able to do that will excel them in whatever field. Whether it be agriculture, which a lot of us have a tremendous background in, whether it be construction, whether it be education, etc. Write the story together. Practice. Standing in front of this group today and storytelling and orating. If there's anything I can encourage, talk to students about finding opportunities to practice. It is a skill. It is not something that is naturally important. I was not any type of public speaker until college. And I took a public speaking class, and I'll never forget a pivotal moment where I had to justify or explain the importance of drinking more milk. It doesn't matter the topic, but I'll never forget that. That was the first time I had any real impact. It was almost a satire. Because I was kind of playing the joke of like, this is really important, even though it's kind of a mundane topic. But I'll never forget how that made me feel and how I went. There might be some impact here. And then finally, you know, major in English. I wish I would have spent more time as a student, and as a, in, in middle school and high school, English was, oh, what's the point here? It's comma, semicolon, whatever. Cool, not important. I can't tell you enough how fundamental though that ability is to literally everything else because it's about communication and how you do that well. And you wanna have impact? You want, to, you want to have teach students to have impact in their professional career or even throughout their educational career. Encourage them to write well and speak well. Because I can't tell you how many professionals I work with that lower their credibility every day because they can't write. It's simple stuff, like a complete sentence. That's the power of storytelling. That's the power of communication. It's being able to do that well. So, I just want to say thank you for taking the time. Oh, I did have my email up there. Um, so for anyone interested, if you ever want to follow up, uh, GarrettMauer at Yahoo.com. Maybe we can follow, that's my personal, it's Garrett.Mauer at Doosan.com if you want to send or follow up on anything professionally. But I'm happy to help, I'm happy to talk more. I, I love doing this. Helping the next generation is critical for all of us. So, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the story. <laughs>
from the time we've gone and taken stuff being, you know, pencil and paper, very physical, tangible assets, and we've moved that digital, be it a computer in our office, a data center that we rent uh, out, or moving stuff up to, for example, what's more common, up to the cloud. It's just an aspect of cybersecurity is a big part of everything we do. So a little bit about Palo Alto Networks and what we do, right? I love starting with our mission and our vision, not because marketing tells me I have to, but because this is what we actually live. Right, first and foremost, we, especially me, when I get involved with organizations, so I cover the whole United States when I show up to an organization and work with various CIOs or CISOs or other key stakeholders, my whole goal is to be their cybersecurity partner of choice. I want them to be able to come to me and say, hey, we have this specific strategic need or business pain or whatever the case may be, and help them find a way to address uh, that safely and securely, not after it's already been deployed, but way before in the planning stage, right? As we're planning, building, deploying, and actually running whatever technology it is. And, you know, from a vision standpoint, we just have this vision where each day right, our world is safe and, safer and more secure than the one before. So, not only is that through deploying these technologies and configuring them properly, but it's also a big impact on ensuring that the students, the future workforce is cyber aware, and that's the big thing that I want to talk about today. From a, a little bit hard to see, sorry about the rendering right here, but from, from a product standpoint, you know, Paul's Network Square, a cybersecurity com company, we touch everything cybersecurity. So as you go through and you send that email, you access that website, you upload that document, whatever the case may be, that's data that is traversing the network. We very much focus on network security, it's where we got our start. But again, a lot of data is moved up to the cloud and development in the cloud is a lot different than development uh, on-premise, right? The, the, there's a lot of cloud-native technologies that are out there, which not only learning about those cloud-native technologies, but how you secure them, because you secure them differently, is very important. So we definitely have that aspect of our business as well. And then the third kind of tangible side of it, if you will, is all around security operations. You have all this great security out there. How do you operationalize that? How do you make sure that your security operations are staying up with your other day-to-day -day business operations, IT operations, things along that line? We have tools that help organizations do that. And then most importantly, in my mind, is, is the education aspect of it and the advisory services aspect of it. If you get a chance, go check out Palo Alto Networks Unit 42. Uh, pretty easy to remember if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, fan, right? So go check out their blog. They have a bunch of really great articles in regards to not only how we've helped our own government, but how we've helped Interpol and how we uh, essentially identify various threat actors out there and, and try to stay ahead of the game in regards to the various ways that threat actors are attacking various types of technology, one of those being AgTech. And one of the nice things about AgTech as well, next slide is, uh, not, not relevant for the story I'm going to tell right now, but one of the nice things about AgTech as well is the last part of the name is tech, right? It's all technology. The, uh, was here two days ago, same room, did a presentation at the Cybersecurity Symposium, and uh, one of the key aspects to that presentation was the threats that AgTech is facing are the same threats that many other businesses are facing. There are new technologies that are being developed, but the way that those technologies communicate, the way that those technologies store data, the way that those technologies ingest information is the same way that an OT sensor, operational technology sensor that uh, manages sewer systems or manages HVAC or other aspects of, of our environments work as well. And there's a commonality in regards to those attack factors. So the nice thing about cybersecurity is we can take the knowledge that we gain and we can apply that to support. So I like tossing this up there because uh, if you are not familiar with the website cyberseek.org, I recommend taking a look at it, especially if you're trying to encourage your students to pursue a, a career in cybersecurity. Cyberseek.org updates the information around the cybersecurity job shortfall relatively regularly. And you can go and click on individual states and see what it's like in the, in the states. And um, I specifically like this data, mainly the one on the right hand side. So right now with uh, this, individuals that have had some type of cybersecurity education, we can fill about 68% of the cybersecurity jobs that are out there, right? So there's a 32% job shortfall. There's a huge, huge need for cybersecurity professionals that are out there. And it's not just being a cybersecurity architect like myself, it's just being, hey, I'm a product manager and I want to 
you know, develop a product. I want to do that with full site security in mind. If I'm running research, I want to, uh, you know, be able to make sure that I'm transferring data in a secure mindset. I mean, pretty much everything that's been talked about today, there is some type of cybersecurity aspect to it. So when it comes to policy networks and what we can offer, uh, two main things that I'd like to touch on here, actually I'll touch on the second thing in the next slide, but first and foremost, we have a full education services uh, department, which is all dedicated to helping educators like yourself in regards to getting the resources you need to be able to train your students, train yourself, whatever the case may be. Uh, beacon.palolitonetworks.com, I'll make sure that that link goes out, but beacon.palolitonetworks.com has a plethora of free cybersecurity training. And one of the other nice things that is um, in our partnership with the state of North Dakota, first and foremost, North Dakota is a, uh, a consumer of our products. So if you go and work, you know, if you're a student and you want to go work for an organization, state of North Dakota is an excellent organization to go work for if you want to especially utilize Pulse Networks products. We also have a partnership where We've helped develop the cybersecurity curriculum, which the state utilizes within the K through 12, K through 20 workforce. Actually, I should say, uh, we've helped develop that cybersecurity curriculum. So that's in partnership with all networks. And then the last part, which is super exciting, we just announced Tuesday. Michael Craig uh, got to announce it, and I got to follow up, and I want to mention it again. But any state of North Dakota citizen gets vouchers for free Polish Network cybersecurity certifications. So that's super awesome, especially if you're uh, you know, looking for a career change or if you're students that are going through those cyber pathways and you want to go through to get some of those certifications, you can do so for free. Absolutely free. I don't get any of that. I still have to pay for it. I'm a Polish Network employee. I still have to pay for it. So, you know, super awesome that we have some of that stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, really excited to be able to announce that. And I think that's all I have. Again, feel free to reach out. So I am the unique guy that has to leave in 20 minutes. Yeah. I think you've been told. So yeah. happy to be part of the panel. You might see me disappear as far as. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. So how's everyone's mind? Swimming? Here, I'm actually going to switch mics. So if you have questions. within the K-12 system. Okay, and then how many of you teach, um, are we all from North Dakota? Uh, all from North Dakota? Are we, how many of you teach in a rural school? Okay, and then to the rest of you are more urban, that's awesome. Um, and how many of you are teachers in, or educators in, in the STEM fields? So for those of you not in the STEM fields, give me a quick shout out. What, what kind of um, educators are we looking at here? How many administrators are here? Maybe I should start with that. Any other administrators? Okay. What other, what other curriculums do we teach here? Communication. Communication, love it, okay. I guess I'm STEM, science and biology. Seven, your STEM, biology. Okay. Chemistry okay. and. Okay, the speakers can come back up here. I'm gonna grab my questions. You know I have them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so thank you. If you're more into that, you're welcome to remember. We have several STEM teachers who can be a teacher. Um, and a few who teach in rural schools and some who teach in urban schools. So this is great. We have a good cross section here for our audience. Let's start with you guys. Who has a question for one of our our speakers? Don't you worry, I have a lot of questions. I actually have a weird question um, that actually doesn't apply to students. Um, with uh, Precision A, you know, you were showing all that technology. Do you do training for people that are already that are already doing work, that are already that already own farms and trying to train them up on this? So I guess like adult education? Training Precision growers. Um, we don't have any formal training per se, 
last year, for example, we put a two-day workshop for teachers across the state of North Dakota, where we're providing some training in precision ag and trying to bring some more of a, the precision ag curriculum into the classroom. Um, I don't do the training at NDSU. We have the extension side of things. Uh, in, in the department, we have um, our extension specialist in precision agriculture that he provides that kind of training if, he, if somebody or in the community request or there is a need for that. Yeah, I, just to follow up because I am an extension, there is a, an extension specialist with Precision A who I believe does trainings with the local agents as well. Um, but he and he was just hired, I think, a year ago, about maybe a little less than a year ago. Yeah, I was uh, forcing that was. You were hiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he started probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that precision making is such a, a growing thing that we need young people trained and current producers to understand that. So that was a great question. I'm going to go to the. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I have a question for all of you, and I'll start with the generic one for everyone. I think it's a provocative question. Look, if you were to go to young people, be it middle school, high school, etc., what is one? number one thing you wish that young people knew today right now? What is one thing you wish young people knew today? I have one. Failure is okay, and it happens constantly, especially in science. You know, we're tends to do, you know, we're doing a project, it's usually 10 steps back, one step forward, so being able to handle that is very important in my career. For me, I would say that food is one of the most important things for us, our bodies, how we function, how we go about the world, our health, the food, what we put into our bodies is one of the things that we really need to pay attention to. And snack food's fun, but make sure we're trying to eat those leafy greens and those vegetables and really try to get a well-rounded well, well diet. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the communication dad wants to hear me say communication, but it's probably not that, right? Um, look, I have a saying that I use a lot with organizations, which applies to young adults, early career folks as well. It's don't let perfection be the enemy of progress, right? I think there's too much impact of social media and influence from others that everybody wants to be perfect and needs to be perfect all the time. But in reality, we're all growing, we're all learning, we're all continuing to become new, better people, and that's the progress we should be focusing on. Perfection. I would say it's okay to care, and it's okay to be excited. And maybe that's just expressing some of my own lived experience, but be excited about stuff, care about things, find you know, find whatever it is, find those things. Uh, I would. I would, if I was talking to me as a young, as a very young person, that's the, that's that's what I would share. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, I would say, be curious. Don't be curious. Be curious. And it kind of goes back to um, Gary was saying, you know, try to figure out how things work and try different things that don't work and figure it out. You know. A lot of times we have uh, the tools to do things, we just don't put the time and effort to figure those things out. So. I love all those advices. I'm gonna add my own. I would also say um, to be passionate about something, right? Everyone has the ability to be passionate, and then you learn to tell your story, you learn to be curious, you learn to ask the questions, it's okay to fail, and while you're doing that, eat, eat a healthy diet, right? So it's all good. Um, right, right. But I definitely think um, that was a, that was a great question and great answers. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yes. Go ahead. Are your genetic barcodes that you're looking for really just nine base pairs long, or did you allow them? No, I couldn't fit them all on the <laughs> screen. So most of the time they're about 100 to 150 base pairs. Yeah. I oversimplified the screenshots. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then do you like use like CRISPR stuff to like splice it and run it through a gel, or what do you do? How do you? That would be super cool if we use CRISPR because that's the next generation of diagnostics for sure is using CRISPR. Our technology is qPCR, so like the COVID PCR test, same thing. This, that's the exact same technology we use to diagnose many viruses. It's the same technology we use to, to detect COVID. When you use that, like, why would you like test one, two, and three? Would that be something microscopic? Because otherwise, you could just look at the bugs morphology or something. Yeah. So the way that we detect all those different species of barcode is that to not try to get too technical. Um, there's a probe that has a colored molecule specific to PES1, PES2, PES3. So we can develop a single test that can co-amplify, co-detect, as well as quantify all three of those tests. And usually we frame the test, okay, there are three pests that have potentially different management strategies, but they present the disease the exact same way in the field. Yeah. So those pests would all be like fungal things yeah, or totally. something you can't differentiate by looking at it. Yeah, by visual detection, can't do it. So, so. it's fungal, do you just test the spores and you just have then, or do you actually get a sample stock of corn with something white on it? All of you are. Okay. Yeah, so we can test the host if it's presenting disease, we can test the residue, which is the decaying crop from last year, we can test the soil if it's a soil borne pathogen, we can test some air if it's spore borne. And then, and then you have like lab techs whose job is to isolate the thing before you run the tests? Yeah, right. okay. yep, yep, so we have lab technicians that do that. I'm sitting on my butt looking at barcodes trying to develop the tests mm -hmm. so that people have fun lab. Rushi had a question. Yeah. My question would be to all of you, if you can share one thing that the educators can incorporate in their curriculum or their classes right away, something tangible or, you know, just one thing. <laughs> I think from a precision or aggregate perspective, you know, something related to GPS. Everybody has a phone that has a GPS in it, um, in it and you can play some geocaching games or something like that. Some like some prize around school or whatever. Yeah. And have coordinates. That I think that uh, for the build some of the basics, uh, understand how GPS and those technologies work. Yeah, I would say from a cybersecurity perspective, uh, Publisher Networks has what we call our Cyber Aces curriculum. Uh, and Cyber Aces is really meant to start like at the kindergarten level, going all the way up through uh, 12th grade and beyond. But um, most importantly, I think out of Cyber Aces is it just helps teach proper cyber hygiene, right? Like I, I asked this question two days ago, like how many of us have been less sick since the pandemic? Uh, because we wash our hands more, we avoid contact with people more, things along that line. We practice better personal hygiene uh, in, in that regard. So, you know, it's kind of the thing that needs to be introduced into uh, just utilizing computers that you log into every day or saving data or sharing information, things along that line. Strong passwords, be careful who you share with, be like, you know, along the curiosity, also be, uh, you know, generally cautious about uh, you know, who you're sharing with and what, what kind of information is. Yeah, definitely the cyber races curriculum would probably be one of the easiest things to get implemented into your daily conversation with students. I would say probably some kind of aspect of with whatever work you're doing, give an opportunity to present some of that information, right? To, to share that story kind of with the company and you know encourage an environment where people feel comfortable and safe doing that, uh, especially the students. I think that that would have impact. Um, for me, I would say that we can always teach kids more about food and nutrition and how it affects our bodies, how we're able to function, our cognitive abilities. Kids are always learning about food, you know, the food pyramid at a very young age is something to easily implement. Um, and then also teaching them about the future jobs in indoor agriculture. I think that a lot of kids, there's a different sector with biology and science to software and engineering to you know, engineering the, the whole system itself and um, 
inventing new ideas for those sorts of things. So just letting kids know that it is a job. You know, most people don't know that it is, and it's a growing sector, and we're gonna need people in the near future to fill those roles. So if you wanna be an astronaut or a YouTuber, they can be an indoor farmer too. My advice is worthless as a communication teacher. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one, do a DNA and strawberry extraction. Now, if you're in STEM, if you're not doing that, a lot of biology teachers do that, but actually having students visualize DNA because they can't, they think they can't see it, but you can see it when it's in large amounts. And the strawberry DNA, you just need dish soap, salt, Ziploc bag, and isopropanol, and you have strawberry DNA. And then they can present a communications class. They could. Be a great How they did. cross collaboration. <laughs> yeah. Yours is yours. I stand correct. Yeah. Okay. Don't you worry. Um, we're with all these educators. They can find connections. Okay. Awesome. Great. Great question. And other questions from the audience. Yes. Yeah, one. Um, with and I'm a Google answer. So feel free to pick and choose. But with um, new employees coming into your workforce or your industry. Do you see anything that they're lacking that you're like, I really wish they would, you know, have more of this skill or something on that, and that you guys are really like, I wish there was something that uh, colleges or high schools could make up for and do that you're missing when you see an employee come into your organization? Yeah, I mean, having been a hiring manager for the past 18 years um, in the communications guys, like, it's actually communication, right? Like, um, there's been a systemic, shift in regards to those that have been raised on digital platforms and are used to the instant gratification of, of not asking questions to peers, but just Googling it or instant messaging, not having to pick up the phone and call and things on that line. And, you know, part of my organization, or I'm part of a sales organization, so it's hard to be in sales and not communicate. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been one of the challenges that I think I, I see in a lot of candidates that apply that don't get the jobs as they have more communications. I, I would say an ability of comfort with problems that don't have solutions. You know, uh, because you know my experience throughout my education is, and rightfully, you you were always there, there was always a solution to the problem. And I think in in industry in the professional world, we find solutions every day, but often there's not a right answer. There is an answer. And there's other answers, and they all have good aspects and, and bad aspects to them, whatever it may be. And having comfort with that idea that there isn't a with certainty, this is the right thing to do, it's a lot of judgment. And a lot of where your values are as an individual or as a company, et cetera, and being able to navigate that um, without massive amounts of anxiety. Mine's kind of basic, but uh, write a uh, cover letter. <laughs> Sometimes they don't do that. So help with that, the communications teacher maybe can help with that. English teachers can help with that. Or chat GPT. Chat GPT. Or at the BC on So I, I do have to admit, the uh, bio that you read about me yeah. used to be like, Five paragraphs long, I fed into Chat GPT. Short. I need a shorter one. I don't want to do it. It's great for some reason. That's when you use Chat GPT correctly, you right? I wrote original content yes. and I used yes. it to short. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> so I would say critical thinking and problem solving skills and conflict resolution. I think there is not enough of that in schools. Um, a lot of times a simple disagreement amongst employees can be solved easily by having a discussion. Um, and there's a lot of passive aggressive and undertones that happen in the workplace. And I feel like that company culture and proper leadership is where that starts. But having employees that are open to that sort of constructive criticism and that have dealt with it before, going into that makes it easier for leadership and management to work with them to help resolve those issues, to create a healthier work environment. So you have conflict in a safe environment is basically easier to deal with this later on. I have a follow-up question. And we talked, those were all wonderful skills that I also see um, as necessary um, as someone who has in the past had to hire people, as well as work with young people and young adults um, for most of my career. But I would like to know from each of you, you know, that those are mostly soft skills. 
um, which are harder to train on, right? Those are partly a development that we grow in our own and our own on our own time. What are what's the education or training like path, do you think, for some of the careers in your fields? How can we be helping young people know what they need to do, whether that's what degrees to get or what types of internships to get? What does the training and an education look like for your fields? Sorry, I always go first when I talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, with a, what was it, 32% yeah. job shortfall, a lot of organizations are realizing that you don't need uh, second, you know, like bachelor's degrees or master's degrees to do these jobs. It's a lot more important about experience and, and uh, just general knowledge of the field, right? I like I have published networks, I would rather hire somebody and I know they're gonna go through two months of training on the college networks in cybersecurity, but um, you know, that's not necessarily gonna be impacted whether they have a bachelor's degree or not. I've hired both individuals and they're, they're you know equally uh, as impactful in regards to the cybersecurity field. So my recommendation would be give them experiences or partner with you know, the state of North Dakota and Michael Gregg, the state CISO, um, definitely have great pathways and partnerships and things on that line that they're building out to try to get more experience into students by the time they graduate high school so that way they are more impactful going into the job, job courses. Regarding products with a capital P and product management, um, Generally, that specific skill set, at least as far as I know, is, is minimally taught in education. It ends up being something you evolve into um, in your career. And so, you know, a sound foundation, either in a technical or a business or a communication skill. You know, when I look at product organizations that I've built uh, and led, it's been anywhere from people with software development backgrounds to engineering to marketing to business development etc some of those more traditional careers so any of those really work um, getting into product management is about having a desire to blend you sort of become the ultimate generalist you're dangerous in all of them but you don't you're not writing code or you're not out selling a product or you know writing content you're facilitating and working on all the core bits that you I almost uh, say that, you know, I think this is something that my wife would say about her son that maybe you don't go to college and you go to school. Go find a job and you find your passion. And once you identify that, then, you know, if you need to go to a four year degree, do that. But if you don't, so find your passion and follow that. Yeah, so we have a couple of interns at our high school now graduating. I don't personally push the PhD route. You don't necessarily need it for a job in market diagnostics or clinical sciences per se. Um, for what I do, you kind of do because you have to like to write a lot and sit down a lot and sit at the computer a lot. That's what I tend to tell students is that the higher you go, the more you sit. Maybe not necessarily for like outreach or certain careers don't. In my career, yeah, you sit down, right? You sit down a lot? Yeah, we sit down a lot. So um, for diagnostics, you don't necessarily need to get a four year degree, you could get a two year degree. You might have trouble getting into a professional diagnostic lab without at least associates, I would think. But internships, we take high school students in. It's all over the place. So for our industry, um, that's what we're trying to get into STEM and create this opportunity for these students so that we can have more students that are trained in you know, horticulture, plant biology, environmental sciences, and things like that. Environmental science is a pretty small career field right now. It's projected to grow. Um, but we really need to provide the opportunity for these students to learn a little bit more about the trade and, and skills of plants in general, um, but specifically in North agriculture. And through the STEM program that we're trying to start up here is to create like a certificate. So they would go through this in high school or um, they would get like some sort of credited hours that would put them towards the university or right out of high school 
being able to get a job at a local greenhouse. You know, it doesn't have to be hydroponic, but they can get their foot in the door, test the waters before they want to jump into a full degree in plant sciences or biology. Awesome. Other questions from the audience? I'm a middle school teacher and teach five through eight, so like my kids aren't thinking of jobs yet. How can I expose them to these things at a level that's that? Because a lot of this stuff, I'm married to a farmer, so like I understood a lot of it. But how do I get them to find interest and keep their interest now, especially with a lot of kids that are, like you said, into the video games, you know, the gaming, they don't want to communicate. How do I get them? <laughs> On my case, I would say reach out to us and invite people to come in from your class. Maybe. Okay. We, we had a couple of times that some schools reach out to us to do it. So the technology that we have with mm -hmm. some sensors and drones, the kids love it. Oh, so. yeah. so. I can bring a strawberry. <laughs> 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 I can use you. Know, as Shanna says, it, is, it can be tough to convince the younger grades you know, about the ATCs and Gs and all the, the DNA analysis. So. When I approach those grades, I usually bring, you know, something to do. Um, insects, like I work on honeybees. Bees are kind of fun, but you know, they're just being stung. But you can pin bees and just do an entomology. So I guess as a geneticist, I think, you know, ignore the genetics and look at the whole organism to, to get them kind of wrapped up in the diversity of life, and then you can start talking about, you know, genetics and genetics. what I said earlier, but Cyber Races is built for to get kindergarten through 12th. Uh, there's going to be 6th, 7th, 8th grade uh, curriculum in there for you. Uh, you know, the other thing that's really interesting too is we hosted a group of 35 uh, students at our headquarters about, uh, about two or three months ago, and um, my, my co-worker and I put together what's called the Capital Black event, right? We thought it was, it was hard for him, right? <laughs> we thought it was really, really difficult, and there was this group of six ninth grade females that absolutely crushed it like we should have had them write it so i would also say like don't be afraid to like introduce advanced topics around probably any of our fields to these students they may catch on a lot faster than it takes some of us to catch on because you know it's career changes for us and things like that too so with that being said i might want to have to disappear so thank you everybody please get my contact information if you want me to hop on zoom and we'll chat with your students or whatever the case may be Thank you so much. I think I would probably echo some of the things said here. Um, maybe add a little bit to it. You know, getting getting our involvement if you can. You know, professionals and doing things that are hand on, that have hands on, that are more fun. Like it's it's almost about to me. It seems like perhaps inspiring curiosity of uh, like. What is this thing? You know, how does it work? And and you know, whether it's technical or or, or otherwise in STEM, but going through it and having those less perhaps directly curriculum based and more like experiencing interesting things, even as a product manager, like coming in and saying like, look at all the cool stuff we work on, right? And like get people excited about, get kids excited about that. You could bring it all together. You can, <laughs> you can take some holes yeah. and then you can fill them back in. <laughs> I, I mean. So they can come to the farm safety camp that Extension puts on and learn how to drive that bobcat safely. <laughs> awesome, great. Bruce, you had a question. Yeah, I, I have a question around artificial intelligence. There's a lot of dilemma and ambiguity in educators and students who are looking for jobs now. There's a lot of talk going around about AI will be taking over your jobs. So considering the interdisciplinary panels that we have here, you know, with the different experiences and the, the situation that you come across, what would be your message to different educators or these students that even we can convey to them that, hey, your jobs are safe, you know, technology is at its own stage, but you still need that human element, or you know the different experiences that so if you each of you can highlight some thoughts around that. 
So our whole Pro Tower runs on AI. Um, and it doesn't replace us. We still need to be there to monitor it, to watch it. Someone still needs to do something. It's going to eradicate some of those smaller jobs that don't really need uh, human interaction, but there will always be a need for humans. Customer service and sales, AI can help out, but it's not going to eradicate the need for that job. And using AI as a tool to assist in that job and using it as a little, you know, little side tool pocket, if you, if you have one of those, or like a Swiss Army knife, you're always gonna have that little bit there. But AI is meant to help us and guide us along the way, so I don't think that it's that much of an issue, but there's a lot of fear around AI right now. There's a lot of jobs around it too. AI is a moving industry, coding and software. I think that there's gonna be room for plenty of growth in the industry, and if they're worried about AI, then they need to become a software writer. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, I was just echoing what Cecilia said. I think, you know, there is many things that AI would help with the agriculture and precision agriculture, but I don't think that anytime soon an AI system is going to be able to make up for not having a farmer down in the field understand <clears throat> what is going on in a way that they I can help. So, yes, it can facilitate a lot of things, but um, there's still gonna see farmers around for many years. I think we need the cyber security guy back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we asked that question today. <laughs> a lot of what I do is in the meat space. As I say, not you know, chat GPT, but I see it as a benefit. I mean, I think it's gonna be tough for you know English teachers and scientific publishers of, of papers. You know, that's where it gets a little, a little crazy. But for worker diagnostics, I want to see chat GPT um, extract DNA and diagnostic tests. As fast as it can do it, right? Yeah. So I will prefacing this, this is a really interesting question. Um, me personally and professionally, I use ChatGPT daily. Um, it, it, it helps. Here's, here's, I've had this conversation a few times. What I liken it to is the base human capability is being increased, right? When you look at, what we talk about, we talk about automation, we talk about AI, we talk about all this stuff. What are computers good at? Computers are good at repetitive tasks, knowledge-based, like pulling knowledge. I can't tell you how much less time I take learning something because I can have a conversation with my computer, right? If you look at Google, what's the difference between Google and Chat, chat GPT? Google, you gotta know exactly what to say to get the information you want. Chat GPT, I would literally type this conversation out and then go back and forth and I get to the answer. I use it to write, I use it to wordsmith things, to find references or, or things that I couldn't, I can't recall, and it helps accelerate that. It, it brings the base up. And what are humans good at? At the unknown, at creativity, at anticipating and doing things that were unexpected. So having AI, quote unquote, doing some of those more base tasks that people have to do today empowers us and enables us to do the things that are more value oriented are more the creative or the unanticipated or the what if scenarios you know and i do see like if you get in some very specific roles even things like accounting or you know creating if, if you're managing spreadsheets on a, on a significant scale and working all of that Imagine what people could do, yet people spend a lot of time just doing that, like data entry and manipulation and cleaning, right, right Larry? Imagine what those people could do if that was faster, and they could spend more time thinking about how to move their business forward, or how to move their career forward, or whatever it may be. At least today, that's what I see, is yes, there are some of those tasks that are integral to what someone does today, that will go away, but it will then enable the time and the mental bandwidth to then be used to do what we do really well compared to what we do. 
I think we have time for one more question. Does anyone have a burning question? Don't worry, I do. Yeah. Gotta get this. So I think I made note of this when um, Paolo was talking, but I think it was true for all of them. And I made note of it when he mentioned, when we were doing, when I was this poor test subject, and he was showing how you know, we moved from eight feet down to the little disc. And I thought, so um, that was about the time that it took me to be born and then graduate from high school. And in that time, right, the, the technology grew fast enough that my brother, who is now farming the farm that my great grandfather homesteaded, right, is now using precision egg every day. And when I call him right now, he's upset because, of course, spraying is late and spraying is hard because it's raining in one field and not the next. Um, I thought to myself, wow, technology is moving so fast. And all of you are talking about these technological things that are helping us move forward. But how do we prepare young people today for jobs that we don't even know about? Right? Because the technology is moving so fast. And I think some of the things we talked about earlier with the with the soft skills that we need to develop are of course important. But how do we keep them curious about your field or where do you see your field in five to ten years? And how do we help to help young people understand that it's not going to be something that we maybe see today? It's a million dollar question and that I know there's no answer to. Um, but I think you know there's thoughts. Bob, what are some thoughts that you have on that? I think it's you know a common term used today are are is like first principle thinking. And I think that applies to our careers and what we do. Um, you know, at this point in time in my career, having a major pivot, like if I suddenly wanted to become go into biology. I would need to start over, right? I would need to go back, there's a lot of education, there's a lot of things, right? So there is like, I am somewhat deterministic in my path. However, on a first principle basis, what's important to me, right? There, there's three things, right? I want to create things. That is a value, that, that fundamental, whether I'm in agriculture, I know Paul for years, we worked in agriculture for many years between com companies and NDSU. I'm in construction now, I was in hydraulics, and component manufacturing, any number of fields. Having a desire to create things is a core value for me that will never change. So whatever path I find, being versatile, right? Being able to make pivots. Did I ever think I'd be here? I had no idea when I was getting my mechanical engineering degree. But I came to find, especially through the ups and downs of careers and companies changing and mergers and acquisitions, I always wanted to create things. Second one, Helping develop fulfilling environments for people to work in, right? And to find meaning. I can't inspire or motivate someone. I can try to build an environment to do that. That transcends any specific job or, or career path or company. And then for me personally, it's I want to see what I can do with the time I have on this earth, right? That's just a fundamental value. What, what can I do? What can I achieve? What can I attain? It's not necessarily, I'm not, I'm not talking about being a millionaire or driving a fancy car, that means absolutely nothing to me. It's what am I capable of? Can I lead, if I'm interested, can I lead a team of 500 people someday in a corporate, you know, in a big corporate setting or build a company someday or whatever? You gotta, you gotta find what is that thing you want? That's that's mine, that's not, I'm not suggesting everybody should wanna be a, a serial entrepreneur or anything like that. But finding those, those first principle kind of core values will always, will keep you feet on the ground and keep students comfortable that their life isn't that job at that company, but they have those things to fall back on. Like our, if, if I ever look and those three things that I just mentioned aren't being fulfilled, I don't feel like I'm doing those, maybe it's time for a change. Um, I don't know if it is going to be appropriate for Take out uh, students, but one thing that I always tell to my students is that they have to understand principles that govern different things. Because once you learn the principles, you can apply the same thing to different situations, solve different problems. Um, 
And a good example that the quality of Zeus for them is that they take a GIS course in um, ASU. There's nothing about precision agriculture. And they apply the same simple tools that they learn in that GIS course to learn to do like count how many plants we have in a row. Which seems to be, from an image of its perspective, seems to be a very complex task. But I always mention that these are the very simple tools that you learn in your QGIS or in your GIS class. It's just you have to stop and think about using the same principles. How do you use it? How you implement that to solve problems? Um, now, coming from a K-12 level, I don't know, I didn't go to school yet, so <laughs> <laughs> I can use that excuse. <laughs> Well, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know where my, my discipline will be in five or ten years. Usually those people that say their technology is five or ten years old, it's usually 20 to 30, so. Um, that's my experience anyway. It's from listening to all the podcasts that I listen to. Yeah. So, um, but I think just going with the flow that um, having students uh, learn from across disciplines is important because biology, what's biology? It's chemistry. What's chemistry is physics. I mean, if you have those foundations, whatever is coming in the future, you'll at least have a general idea of, of the background, of what's behind the curtain, at least in some aspects. It's philosophical, I guess. But yeah, just do everything, learn everything. <laughs> learn it all. Learn it all. I was going to say, develop a skill to be cross trainable. Um, you're cross trainable, you're not as expendable as somebody else, and always look for efficiencies. That's why ChatGPT was invented. You know, a lot of the reason why old ways like newspapers are bleeding out is because we have found new ways to go ahead. So, if we're teaching these kids to stay on top of the trends and to keep looking for efficiencies in what they're doing, it'll lead to new innovative ideas, keep them creative, and keep them out looking towards the horizons and what else is out there and how they can better improve themselves and teach themselves those new skills. Excellent. All excellent ideas. Well, thank you so much um, to the audience for your excellent questions and to our panel. Um, one quick note, Henry from Bytespeed has brought the flight simulator um, in the back. So if you're interested, um, I'm not sure if Henry's going to come up and say any words, um, but also you, I'm sure you can stop back here at the end and have a conversation with him. Here comes Henry. You can at least wave and say hi. Hi everyone, um, I'm Henry Burke with uh, Flightspeed. Uh, we're a tech company in Moorhead. We got started in 1999. Um, most of our business, about 80%, is K through 12 um, in higher education. Um, and we've always kind of been a company that wanted to be on the forefront of helping schools and kids find new careers. And one of those that we kind of stumbled on kind of the last year is Flightspeed. Um, 80% of pilots are going to retire in the next five years, which is kind of a crazy statistic to think about. Um, and there's not a lot of people going into the industry, and it's only going to grow. I mean, everyone takes flights every day. And a lot of us are you know, business people. We're constantly flying around the globe, and that's not going to change. And with drones becoming a big thing, especially the North Dakota right now, um, flights just continuing to grow. And getting kids involved at a young age, getting them to try things like flight simulator, to experience it, it's an awesome opportunity to get kids started young so they can find out if they really like that in a career. Um, you can go to college for um, flight school if you want to, but you can also just start right out of high school. Um, you can even get credit in high school that count toward your education to become a pilot. And you can even log hours on a flight simulation rig toward your pilot. Um, so being able to have that opportunity as a kid at a young age, you know, even if you just have one simulator and you can teach classes on it, um, we work with a company called AOPA. They have a free curriculum that you can teach flight simulation on. Um, and it's just, it's a really good opportunity for kids to kind of grow up that shell and try something that maybe they wouldn't get to try otherwise. So um, I definitely, if you guys want to come try it out, you can sit down, fly a plane, try to land one. It's not as easy as it looks, I promise you. But um, it is fun um, and it's a great opportunity. And I'd love to chat with you guys about it. So thank you. Thank you. Well. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
what's going on now. So, uh, as we're getting uh, close to the conclusion, um, to the attendees, I want to mention some of the educators are here for the professional development credit. I want to request, uh, just highlight to, uh, that everybody must register with the NDSU Distance and Continuing Education. This is, I just put a screenshot of how the page looks like, so make sure you do register. All the uh, professional development registered, registered people will be sent an assessment form, and this is a screenshot of how that Google form will look like. And you will, you want to make sure that you take the pain point report with you because you would be expected to go through this and listen to two sessions of the Grand Farm podcast. And the link to that is also attached in this form, so you don't have to worry. But you will have all the information in the email. Uh, there was, uh, there's a lot of papers around. There's, these are all resources. I know somebody had asked about how we can connect with the students more. So uh, Darla has already talked about uh, the Eden Grow systems. You can reach out to her. There's information about her and how you can possibly get uh, a tower in your schools, or if there's other people who might be interested in getting um, things started with an indoor ag scope. Then we have our other partner, Farm, um, North Dakota Farmers uh, Union. They have sent another piece of resource. This is about K-12 curriculum and different camps that they're hosting for K-12 students. So I think this is another resource that you might want to look into. Lastly, um, now we have another partner here from Chamber. Jenna, if you can come over. Uh, you see a, a handout here, and I would love Jenna to talk about this because this is another fascinating tool. And before Jenna takes over, I just want to mention, before you guys head out, we request you to look into the flight simulation stuff that Bitespeed has. You can have a hands-on experience and look how you can possibly incorporate that into your schools. And then we have a happy hour at Cowboy Jacks, 4 through 6 p.m., so there's free drinks. If this session has been overwhelming, please feel free to get drunk. It's on Grand <laughs> Farm, so yeah. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know how I can follow it. These are educators, you know. This has been a great panel. Uh, my name is Jenna Mueller. I'm with our uh, local chamber of commerce. And I'm here a little bit to talk about our night adventures and an invitation to all of our educators here in the room today to join us. Um, between June 26th and 30th, we have a professional development opportunity to where if you want graduate credit, you can register with NDSU or you can attend for free as many of the sessions that uh, you want. We've paired up with over 17 businesses and nonprofits this summer to give experiential experiences to you as educators. And then you can connect those um, experiences directly back to the classroom with students, uh, we had a great time running it last year uh, with about 10 uh, our businesses within the community and had really great feedback um, from Cass County's uh, Career and Technical Education Center. And so we just really invite you to come on out during that week. We'll have a kickoff uh, celebration period that very first Monday. Uh, if you are interested in the graduate credit, you need to attend five of these sessions and uh, listen to a podcast from Startup Crew from Emerging Prairie, since they won't be meeting during that summer, um, summer experience. But if you have any questions on our Ignite Adventures, I invite you to ask uh, myself any questions you might have, or Dr. Curtis back there, um, also known as the communication teacher from today's panel. Thank you so much. Uh, one last thing. Thank you, Jenna. That was quite resourceful. And, um, we, Grand Farm has some upcoming events that I forgot to mention. We have Autonomous Nation Conference coming up 29th of August that will be held at Microsoft Campus. Uh, we're hosting a Castleton Livestock event, so it's going to be hosted at our new campus. It's targeted at for three through six graders, and we're going to have Castleton FFA students run the show. So you're more than welcome to attend, bring your students. And then for next year, we have Space Ag and Cultivate Conference. And you can find all the information on our website when the circle that you see here, that's highlighting the events. Uh, so if you're interested, you can find all the information. 
This event is not possible without the amazing speakers. I must say every single speaker said yes to me with my first request. So I'm just full of uh, gratitude for each one of you. Our co-moderator, uh, Katie Tyler, uh, and of course our sponsors who paid for this workshop. I want to thank each and every one of you. This is a community that's full of resources. So just you just have to reach out and we're going to make sure that you get the right resources that you want to. Thank you everyone for all your time and attention.